Happy Friday, interwebs, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing all the biggest networking and information security stories every week and to sharing, hopefully, some practical tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security geek, Corey Knockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting March 23rd, 2015. Why don't we jump right in by recapping this week's daily episodes? Today I'm covering a Twitch security breach. You may have heard of Twitch. It's a popular video game related video streaming site that Amazon recently acquired for around $1 billion. Well today in a Twitch blog post, they said they discovered some sort of unauthorized account access. And as a result, they've reset all the passwords for their entire site, as well as all the key streams and all the YouTube and Twitter connections with Twitch. So if you're a Twitch user, you'll You'll definitely have to go and reset your account on Twitch. Now they don't really share any details. They don't share how many users are really affected, if bad guys have stolen their password database, or what's going on. But you should assume the worst. If you're a Twitch user, not only should you reset your password, but if you use that password on any other website, I really recommend you reset it there as well. And this brings us to our normal password handling practices. You really need a strong and long password password. It's best to use a random password that's 14 or more characters long. You also should use a different password on every single website you go to. Now if this sounds hard, it can be if you're trying to do it yourself. But my number one recommendation is use a password manager. A password manager makes it very easy for you to use very strong passwords everywhere, so I highly recommend them. Today I'm talking about BitWhisper, which is a heat-based back channel. This comes from research from Ben Gurian Cybersecurity Labs in Israel. And it's essentially research on how you can use heat as a communication back channel. Basically, the researchers set up two computers, and modern computers have highly sensitive thermal sensors, and they're designed basically to check to make sure that your computer isn't overheating when it's doing heavy computation. Anyways, the researchers found with the proper software, one computer can send communications to another computer by fluctuating its heat in a pre-assigned way so that the sensor in the other computer picks up on these changes and thus picks up on the communication. Now, of course, for this sort of attack to work, both computers need specially installed malware on them. On top of that, the computers have to be 15 inches close to each other or less in order for the sensors to pick up the heat fluctuations. And finally, you can only send about eight bits of data per hour with this particular communication back channel, which is a very small amount of information. Nonetheless, the researchers are going to take this to a security conference and talk about how you can use this back channel in an air gap network to send communications from a computer that may not have a network connection. Now, I do find this to be a very fascinating communication technique, but I don't think it's very practical in the real world. I don't think you'll see a lot of attackers use it. It needs malware to be pre-installed and there's more efficient ways to actually uh, set up back channels for communication. But if you are interested in this sort of fascinating computer trickery, I highly recommend you look up Tempest, which in my opinion is much more interesting and concerning. Tempest is basically the project where governments were trying to figure out how they could snoop on electrical devices using emanations, whether they be electromagnetic emanations emanations, radio frequencies, or noise emanations. And a great example of this is something called Van Eck Freaking, where the researcher of that name found that he could actually capture the display from a CRT monitor from a distance away by actually paying attention to the electromagnetic frequencies put out by that CRT monitor. And since then, governments have found all kinds of interesting ways to snoop on electrical devices by their emanations. Now, I find this much more concerning. It doesn't rely on malware being on the device, and governments have known about this since World War II and have been using it to some extent. 
As a quick digression, if you ever wondered where the term tinfoil hat came from, it's probably related to Tempest in that once we realized that electromagnetic and radio frequencies could leak from our devices, we started using Faraday cages to shield those leaks, and thus conspiracy theorists worried about people snooping on them would wear a tinfoil hat to avoid satellite communications reading our brainwaves or whatever. In any case, it's funny how even the craziest idea is based on seeds of truth. BitWhisper is interesting, but don't expect cyber criminals to adopt this attack methodology anytime soon. Today I want to use a small security story as an excuse to talk about a bigger security problem, and that's malicious or dangerous documents. Today a HelpNet security article pointed out the increase in Office macro-based malware. You probably heard of Office macros, the, the code or script that you can add to an Office document to do automated tasks. For the longest time, bad guys have leveraged macros to do bad things, to ultimately install malware on your computer. In fact, this sort of evil macro technique is over a decade old. The HelpNet security article pointed out research from Trend Micro and even earlier research from Microsoft that shows macro-based malware is making a comeback. And that's interesting in itself, but the real point of this video is to warn you that documents can be dangerous. Macros are just one of the ways bad guys can leverage documents to install malware. You know, the software we use, like Word and Adobe Reader to read documents can suffer from security uh, vulnerabilities. On top of that, today's document isn't just a document, it's a multimedia file that can have tons of embedded content, whether it be a link or flash content or video content or whatever. And thus, a document has a huge attack surface that can give a bad guy access to vulnerabilities in other software as well. The point is, just opening a document can result in malware silently installing on your computer. Now I suspect a lot of your users realize that executable files can be dangerous. If you get an unsolicited email with an executable file, you might want to avoid it. However, I think many users think that documents are benign or inert and can't hurt them. And as a result, advanced sophisticated attackers have been using documents a lot more in spear phishing email because they realize that users are more apt to click on that particular content. Now as a security professional, I'm sure that you already knew that documents can be dangerous. But again, I suspect many of the folks at your organization don't know this. So take this as an opportunity to remind users to be careful with documents. Getting unsolicited documents contains some risks, so make sure your users are very skeptical when they're opening documents from folks that they don't know. Today I want to talk about the end of life of Windows Server 2003. A couple of articles have turned up recently pointing out that Microsoft is going to discontinue the extended support for Windows Server 2003, which was a very popular server product from Microsoft. In fact, according to some reports, there's over 11 million servers that still use Server 2003. Now this of course has security implications. As soon as they end of life it, it means there's going to be no more security updates. Yet there's still plenty of flaws in 2003. If you followed Microsoft Patch Day for the past few months, there have been flaws in 2003 to this day. So this kind of puts us into an issue that we just went through with Windows XP. It's a popular enough operating system that people still use it, and yet it's going to become increasingly more vulnerable as it goes without patches. So the takeaway here is quite simple. As an administrator, if you're using Server 2003, you need to start planning your migration path if you haven't already. Server 2012 has been out for a while and works quite well. Now do know that security vendors like WatchGuard are not going to abandon you. You know, as bad guys still make attacks that work against a Windows Server 2003 or malware that happens to work on Windows Server 2003, we're not going to discontinue creating IP signatures or antivirus signatures that will catch those attacks in malware. So having a security appliance, having security controls can help mitigate this particular risk. That said, you always want to keep servers patched and you have compliance to think about too, which does say your servers have to be up to date. So if you haven't thought about Windows Server 2003 migration, start thinking about it now. Today I'm talking about Cisco's latest router patch. During the week, Cisco released an advisory warning about 
three vulnerabilities affecting iOS, the popular operating system that they use on their routers and switches. Basically, it suffers from three vulnerabilities having to do with Autonomic Networking Infrastructure, or ANI. And this is essentially a feature that allows uh, routers to connect to a pre-configured domain so that network administrators can easily manage them. Two of the vulnerabilities in ANI are basically DOS vulnerabilities, so bad guys can send packets that will disrupt your router. However, one's a little bit worse. Basically, by sending a special AN message to your router, a bad guy might be able to make it join a malicious uh, domain and thus have limited configuration access to that router. So long story short, if you're a Cisco iOS user that has this ANI feature enabled, you definitely need to go get this patch. Cisco gives it a CVS rating or a severity score of 9 out of 10. So it's pretty important to patch your routers. That's all I have for you this week. I hope you found it interesting and educational. As always, there were a ton of other stories out there, including a couple of researchers finding new weaknesses in RC4, which is one of the popular encryption ciphers used by SSL TLS. So if you're interested in that or any other security stories, be sure to check out our blog at blog.watchguard.com or watchguardsecuritycenter.com. That's where I post this video, and in that post I have a reference section with links to all kinds of other interesting stories as well. Also, you can follow me on Twitter for other security news, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuard Tech. And don't forget to give my YouTube channel a view as well. That's it for today. As always, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.